Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Prime Comments. And before I jump into your comments today, I just want to give a big thanks to all of you guys. There were thousands and thousands of comments made on our videos this past week. There were a lot of very good discussion points. Even people that were disagreeing with me were at least presenting extremely solid information. Although I think some Pokemon fans aren't too happy with me. But it is what it is. I just want to say thank you. It was very hard. This is the most difficult week I have had choosing which comments to respond to since I have to limit it in order to make sure this episode stays at a reasonable length. But uh, yeah, speaking of reasonable length or unreasonable in this case, our first comment uh, comes from our Nintendo will continue to support 3DS. Uh, and they're completely unsure of their future platform video. Uh, and the reason that I say that this is a, a bit weird is this is the longest comment we have ever featured on the show. Let's get right into it. This comment comes from Random Conan. And he says, Nintendo Prime, as you know, Switch has been selling very well this past fiscal, he meant fiscal, year. Along with huge praise from critics when it comes to their game library. The concept I am trying to put forward today is the idea of a more powerful console only version of the Switch, which would exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Why did you, I think he meant himself, just write in capital letters, you may ask. I did this so you wouldn't be confused with how it would be executed, like you do with my previous posts. So without further ado, let's begin. Number one, how it would work business-wise. The Nintendo Might, yes, let's just call it the Might for now, would be advertised as a more powerful console that plays Switch games at high settings. And the normal Switch would be advertised as a low-end portable that can happen to turn into a console. This would not cannibalize either one, because if the power prefer, uh, if the per consumer prefers power, they might buy the might. Uh, but if the consumer wants a cheaper portable that plays new games, they buy a Switch. You see, it would balance both target demographics and give Nintendo that extra moolah. Cash money! Number two, third-party AAA that work only on might every other uh, platform except Switch, to appease the so-called core gamers. Basically, graphically intensive games that would never run on Switch. As an example, Star Wars Battlefront 2 could instead be ported to the might. What this would do is interest those who play on platforms like Xbox or PlayStation, as it would be a system that not only plays the AAA Nintendo games, but also the AAA third-party games at high settings. Example, Mario Odyssey and Doom at 4K 60fps. This would reintroduce or even introduce people to Nintendo's amazing game library. This would be a great selling point to gamers who love graphics but never picked up a Nintendo system because they were weak. Think about the amount of players at your school who would pick it up. Number three, the specs. As said earlier, the system would be identical to those of a PlayStation 4, but instead uses an AMD graphics card like the RX 480, which has a 2GB VRAM version. Because it is a console only, it would would come with the formerly known as Switch Pro Controller as the main controller. The CPU would be a Tegra X2, which is much more power efficient than the first one. First off, uh, I want to thank you, Random Koenig. And I chose your comment because a lot of people said, well, you know, how about this? Instead of Nintendo releasing a 3DS successor, they treat Switch as a 3DS successor and then come up with a standard console. There's a lot of people I know out there that don't really like the Switch. Uh, they want a standard under-TV console that's super powerful. It's probably been something that people have been demanding since the Wii era, to be honest. Uh, but uh, let me just address each of your points, um, how it would work uh, business-wise. Uh, you talk about how uh, the mic could have um, you know, Nintendo games at higher fidelity, 4K, 60 FPS in your example. Um and uh, if people want a cheaper portable, and they all can play like the same games, is essentially what you're saying, that uh, Nintendo Switch would still have their games, Nintendo might would have uh, Switch games, and it'd all be cross-compatible. Uh, that sounds uh, fine in, I guess, in hindsight. Uh, I actually would love a more powerful underbox TV, a more powerful underbox Switch even, or whatever the case may be. But here is my issue. The Nintendo Switch is going to cannibalize the Might sales for Nintendo fans. Nintendo fans are not going to see a reason to pick up a Might and own a Switch. Because if they both play the same Nintendo games, you're going to go with the cheaper of the two options. And you're going to go with the option that still works with your TV while taking it on the go. 
the problem that we run into here is uh, it, this is going to be a problem in general with an underbox console, no matter what, is that the Nintendo Switch is a hybrid system that's being advertised as a home console. If they release a home console that's not hybrid, that uh, you know is most definitely a home console, not, not a hybrid console, not portable, not only does it kill their entire marketing plan for Switch, which has been that Switch is a portable home console, console from day one that's been nintendo's marketing not only does it go throw blatantly against that marketing which is why nintendo is not going to do it and if they did it would be stupid uh it's that <sighs> How, I, i'm trying to find a succinct way to put this because i'm not trying to insult the idea i understand why this demand exists I just don't think the Nintendo might competing against... Like, the reason 3DS and, and, and Wii U, if it sold well, or, like, the reason DS and Wii uh, worked well together as, as complementary systems to each other is because they couldn't play the same games. Wii was entirely focused on the motion controls, and it was more powerful than a DS. A DS was focused on touch controls and two-screen experiences. So, like, they were both creating games that really couldn't be done on each other's systems. So that is why those systems worked so well in tandem. Same is even true when you start talking about the Game Boy and all that stuff, and, and it lasting through generations. The home console, the home console games couldn't really work on a Game Boy. So it, it worked well in tandem because you had what was like a mini a mini portable gaming experience, but when you were at home, you would get the vastly superior gaming experience with the SNES and the N64 and the GameCube and all that stuff. So uh, having the exact same games be playable on Switch as are on what you call the Nintendo Might, uh, to me, is just a bad idea. The only way it's going to work is if the Nintendo Might has different games than the Nintendo Switch. But then at that point... Um, what's Nintendo going to do because Nintendo Switch has the power for console-like games and now all they're making are console-like games for two platforms. So then you run into the issue of uh, game droughts again from Nintendo. So I, again, that's just my personal opinion. We're just having a conversation here. Feel free to respond and maybe I'll, I'll hit you back up in the comment section. Uh, your second point is that third-party AAAs, uh, there will be third-party AAA games that would only work on the might. Uh, so they can appease the so-called core gamers. And, you, I, I mean, I get what you're saying. I'm not going to go back over that comment too much. All I can say is, why would uh, people who are interested in those games ditch their PlayStation 4 and Xbox Ones to come to Nintendo? Just because they can play Nintendo games? If they wanted to do that, they would already buy a Switch. There, I, I think people confuse that there's a very little crowd of people that want... Um, all these 4K, 60 FPS, uh, AAA games, in addition to 4K, AAA, Nintendo games on a Nintendo platform, using the Nintendo ecosystem, using Nintendo's, you know, flubbed online system. You gotta remember, there's a lot more that go into PlayStation 4 and Xbox One than just the visuals and, and the raw power of the platforms. There's an entire ecosystem built around it. Nintendo's ecosystem has been behind the eight ball for years. I don't think anyone wants to abandon ecosystems that they have fully invested a ton of money into to join an inferior ecosystem. Um... You know, just to just to play Nintendo games in addition to the games they already play and love. Plus, if they own a PlayStation 4, they're probably heavily invested in PlayStation 4 exclusives, Xbox One invested in Xbox One exclusives, PC invested in PC exclusives. It's asking a lot to cannibalize the current market from other companies. This only really would work at the start of a new generation. So, say when PlayStation 5 launches, when Xbox 2 or whatever they call it launches, Maybe a Nintendo might could come out at that time and maybe cannibalize into some of PlayStation 4's audience as we're kicking off a new generation. But I, again, I just think that PlayStation and Microsoft are just going to do it better. Because that all they have done since they came into the market is do it like this more powerful console, online ecosystem stuff better than Nintendo. It's why Nintendo has had to do all these crazy different things. Because believe it or not, Nintendo at one point was one of the more powerful dogs in the industry. As soon as Xbox and PlayStation started pushing power, that was kind of it for Nintendo in the power game because they're not as good at, at it as that. Your last point then is obviously on the specs. For starters, if we're talking 4K 60 FPS, it's not a Tegra X2. I'm sorry. It, it, you don't use mobile processors in a game console that sits under your TV. That would be a terrible decision. If nothing else, they would use one of the cheaper Ryzen ones that you can get for under 100 bucks uh, from AMD if they went with the AMD partnership. Uh, and obviously the Tegra is a uh, NVIDIA thing, and here you have 
an AMD graphics card with a Tegra X2 processor. So now you're talking about cross, you know, basically taking two massively competitive companies that are going to be looking for console exclusive contracts here, and and having Nvidia and AMD working in the exact same system. On top of that, an RX 480 can't do 4K in the first place. So there's that. Um, yeah, so. I understand, you know, you're, you're picking parts that are cost-effective, I assume. Uh, actually, we don't actually know. The Tegra X2, for all we know, can be really expensive. But the Tegra X2 is also not a good choice here because the Tegra X2 is not just a processor. It's an APU. It's an all-in-one. It's a processor and GPU in one. So that would just be a bad choice. If you're going to have a dedicated graphics card, you don't buy a processor that also has dedicated graphics. Um, not ones that are especially like Tegra X2 where they're not, it's not just like a throwaway, oh, we just have this so you can run a monitor. No, they have it so they can run games. So they're a significant price point of the X2 is for the ability to play games and stuff. So like you would, you wouldn't use that. You would use something cheap from, from AMD, uh, if you were somehow able to work that out or what's more likely is something cheap from Intel. Intel has a lot of cheap options out there, uh, or heck maybe, you know, for all we know, NVIDIA maybe has their own own processor that you, you could use, or uh, in, in this case, AMD. Like, if you're using the AMD graphics card, you would use an AMD processor. But it is what it is. Uh, we also can't throw out the fact that it could be an integrated and custom chip. Who knows? Uh, but, yeah, I don't think that the specs you're using work for what you're hoping, and I don't think that anyone... Uh, I might say no one wants this system because I would like one. I just don't think people like me and you and others are a big enough piece of the market for Nintendo to invest a lot of money. Uh, if you want to look at, you know, 4K 60 FPS, um, the Xbox One X is a 4K system that most of the games can't even run at native 4K, and most of the games can't run at 60 FPS. So that's the Xbox One X, and that's a $500 system. Are we talking about the Nintendo might being a 600 700 $800 system to hit 4K 60 FPS to do what PCs do? I... Yeah, I, I think your people's expectations here are a little unrealistic for something like this. Anyways, uh, thank you for your comment. I really appreciate some alternative opinions to my own. Even though I actually really want this, I, I don't see a market for it personally. But you know what? I don't work in marketing, so maybe I'm completely off base. Uh, the next comment we have comes from the My Nintendo Gold Points can be used on the Switch eShop to make purchases. Uh, and this one comes from Wow's Nav, and they say, I'm... I'm just a bit concerned that there are adults, more like man-children, who care this much about children's toys and the meaningless points accrued on them. If you're in your 30s and still playing video games instead of raising a family, you could at least be doing it on PC instead of a game console, especially a Nintendo one. Now, obviously, this person's using the troll face for their icon, so my initial reaction was, uh, they're obviously a troll. But then I look at how they articulate this, and it makes me think that there's more to it here than just uh, trolling, that this person actually believes some of this stuff. And I'm not going to sit here and uh, defend uh, myself um, too much. I mean, you know, he talks about, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm literally what he's describing. You know, he says, you know, you're in your 30s and still playing video games instead of raising a family. I'm like, no. Nah. The thing is, I'm in my 30s, I'm playing video games, and I'm raising my family. In fact, video games are now part of how I make money, hence video games are actually helping support my family. But that, that's, a, a, I guess, a different conversation for another day. And then, you know, it's saying that you can at least do it on PC. I, I think, here's the thing. This is a prime example of, of fanboys and fan wars and uh, culture on the whole. Because I think gaming in general, while it is more popular and more widespread than it's ever been, I still think it's widely frowned upon. Uh, and I say that not just because of Wowzers here, who potentially could be trolling, but because I even, you know, I, if I just look at closer to home, um, my family and my fiance's family don't understand what I do as a YouTuber. They don't understand how I make money. They don't understand the culture of gaming. They don't understand the passion, the, the love I have for this industry and for Nintendo. Uh, they always view what I did as this is a hobby, this is a hobby. You're always going to graduate college, which I am working on. Uh, and once you do that, you're going to go out there and get that real job um, and, and give up on your dreams and grow up. Um, it's something. It's a criticism I get from people I'm surrounded with, not necessarily in my home, but you know, surrounded with in my family. Uh, my friends are actually a little more understanding of what I do, but 
it's the thing is is what I do isn't normal um, and when there, anytime you do something normal uh, or that isn't normal there's tend to be people who consider themselves to be normal that don't understand it uh, my parents have no idea how you make money off of YouTube uh, they have no idea about super chats and donations and, and, and why people would even do that. Why would people give me money during a live stream to do a shot of alcohol? You know, they pay me $5 to do a shot of rum chata when that rum chata shot probably only cost me a dollar. Uh, but the, the grander point isn't so much, you know, of what the alcohol costs. It's about showing support to a creator. Um, and, and my parents don't get that because they don't watch YouTube videos. And people just don't understand um, this lifestyle. And they don't understand this passion unless you live it. And a lot of my audience is younger than me. Um, you know, I had this conversation with my fiance the other day. You know, when you're 50, you know, how are you going to feel when you're making YouTube videos that are being watched by 10-year-olds? And first off, I, my, my, my only response is, well, if it's ad revenue, why do I care if people are 10 or if they're 50? I, I mean, what's it matter to me? If a 10-year-old wants to watch a 50-year-old talk about video games, that's on them, man. That ain't got nothing to do with me. Uh, but most of my audience is between the ages of 18 and 20, or I'm sorry, 18 and 35, which is a little bit older than me, but a, a larger chunk of my audience is between 18 and 30, which is younger than me. And I, I can't tell you guys why you watch me, but all I can say is that you guys understand what other people don't. And, and Wowser here, you know, he doesn't understand why, you know, someone in their 30s can play a Nintendo system. One, that's still obviously the general reputation of Nintendo being kitty, uh, that calling it a toy. Granted, Nintendo would agree with them that Switch is a toy. Uh, but that's the thing, all video games are a toy. Like when you play, when you talk about playing games on your PC, guess what? Your PC's a toy. Unless you use it for work, it's literally a toy. Your phone, unless you're using it for contacting family members or work, everything else you do on your phone, you're using it as a toy. You're using it for entertainment. Uh, so that's just kind of the way I feel. Uh, you guys let me know uh, your opinions on this because I think we can have a deeper conversation about the general opinion of YouTubers, the general opinion of video games, and uh, how this affects you as you get older. Because obviously, six years ago, people didn't really look down on me, including my family. Here I am, you know, in my 30s, early 30s, and I'm actually doing better as a YouTube content creator than I've ever done before. I don't know. I guess, what's your feeling? Like, my dream is to do, do this Nintendo Prime content creation thing for the rest of my life. Um, eventually make enough money that I can start investing in, in 401ks and retirement accounts and all that stuff. Because obviously I have to have a retirement. I don't, I'm not planning on going to make my kids take care of me when I'm older. But I don't know. You guys let me know what you think about all this. Uh, I think it's a very interesting conversation. And I'm on this side of the camera. You guys are on the other side. So let me know what you think um, and, and where we stand culturally with this YouTube and, and gaming shtick as we get older. Maybe some of you guys even know because you get frowned upon as, you, as you're older in your game. Um, moving on, Whew. our third comment this week comes from, what do you want Pokemon on Switch to be? Lots of people mad at me on this one. Um, I can't tell you how many times I was called a Gen 1 or even though I clearly said I was done after Gen 2, but whatever, I guess that still people lump you in with Gen 1 and then I wasn't even whining about Pokemon being worse. Never came out of my mouth. Pokemon is probably by and large better today than it was when I was a kid. And I said that in the video, but whatever. Uh, and this one is from Anonymous. Uh, he says, dude, I love you. I really do. Oh, thanks, man. I am in no way faulting you for being away from the franchise for subjective reasons. But I really couldn't stand this video. You literally sound like an old man saying, well, back in my day. Uh, like, I get it. You're out of the loop. This isn't the issue. But you're advocating backwards stepping. You sound cranky and frustrated. It's cringy and not something I really want to see more of as far as your content goes. I'm not trying to bash you. I love your channel and I watch every update, but this is a weak moment. But I'll be a devil's advocate. I get why you feel the way you do and said what you said. I just think you could have better articulated yourself, maybe script and proofread before you upload it. So here's a, one thing on the final mark. I don't actually script most of my videos. 
Uh, most of my videos are raw and uh, from me. Now, there's, there's multiple takes at times or, like, one long continuous take where I cut out bits because I know I kind of messed up. So, like, I redo it and then I cut it out and it's edited it all together. And hopefully you guys don't notice that much because I try to make it sound like a smooth transition. But obviously, uh, when I'm talking about something like Pokemon, where I openly and freely admit that I'm way out of the loop with the franchise, um, I, I try to... Th th I don't think... Here's the problem I have with this, and a lot of people who commented. Uh, they're trying to shut me down like my opinion shouldn't matter just because I haven't played Pokemon extensively since Silver and Gold, and I don't think that's right. Uh, I don't think... Now, you could almost argue it's a little elitist to say just because you've been playing more Pokemon games than I haven't been playing them longer that your voice should matter more than mine. I'm not going to say that your voice isn't important. I think our voices are equal. I think I have just as much a right to talk about the future of the Pokemon series as you guys do that have more experience. It's just as long as you clarify where your experience with the series comes from and I clarify where my experience with the series comes from before we talk about it. And I did that. So I'm not, I don't feel bad about anything that I said. There were even some people that said, hey, you know, you, we, I thought you were just going to whine the whole video, but your ideas are actually good, and I've played Pokemon all these years. I'm like, that's, uh, that's great. I'm not saying that you have to agree with my ideas. It's just I, I feel like it's important to have this conversation because how many are like me? In the comments, how many people essentially admitted that they were Gen 1ers um, or that they fell out of Pokemon after it expanded beyond 151? A lot of people. And I don't like... It. What sucks about it and what makes it so hard to get back into Pokemon is the community. Uh, the community really pushes back against people who haven't played Pokemon in a long time uh, because they're just going to call them irrelevant. You don't matter. Pokemon's not for you. Pokemon's built for the competitive community. Even though the competitive community, as big as it is for Pokemon, is a very tiny fraction of the total sales of Pokemon. So... I don't actually think the competitive community is the focal point of Pokemon. I'm just throwing that out there. I know I admitted we're more on my stances, but I've been paying attention to the competitive scene for a long time with Pokemon. And, uh, yeah, the sales of Pokemon massively outweigh the actual size of the competitive scene. But it is what it is. Um, the fact that the competitive scene is as healthy as it is is a testament to how popular Pokemon is in the first place. So this is uh, it's just a weird conversation to have. Um you know, there's only so far I could talk about with Pokemon. And I openly, in that video, asked people that are more experienced to come into the comment section and tell me about all the new things that have happened since Gen 1 and Gen 2. Uh, I, I openly wanted people to tell me because I'm honestly curious. And I know a lot of people said, oh, you should do... More. Like, I think one of the top comments was, uh, you should do more research when you talk about Pokemon. I'm, I'm not going to. Because the research that I feel is required doesn't involve Google. It involves playing the games. When I'm asking for people to tell me what has changed in the game, I'm asking them to tell me from their own experiences. I'm not asking them to go into Google and let me Google that for you and look up all the changes. No, I want people to tell me their experiences with this stuff. And for me to do research on Pokemon would require I go back and play, what is it, seven, six generations of Pokemon now? Something like that? Because I think we're at Gen 8 or Gen 9. I can't even remember exactly. Uh, I think I the think, no, Switch game is Gen 8, if I recall. Because I know that some of the games were also like remasters of old games. And then like Black 2, White 2 might not be considered a new generation. More like a, a, a point five generation. Something like that. Um, I don't know. You guys know, again, a lot more about that than I do. But I, I feel like the only way I can get that experience is to play the games myself. And I don't think that I have the time to do that, unfortunately. So, I am getting back into the Pokemon series with Pokemon on Switch. And I feel like my perspective, even if it's not your perspective on Pokemon, is important because there's a lot of people that are in my shoes where we grew up with it when we were kids and then we just stopped playing for whatever reasons. And now we might be interested in getting back into it with Pokemon on Switch. So my experience with that game and how I feel about it could massively impact a lot of people that feel the same way. And just because you feel differently it shouldn't diminish what I have to say. It might, not, it might mean what I have to say means less to you and that's fine. But what you have to say as someone more experienced could arguably mean less to me as well. So we have to treat each other's opinions as equals here. 
uh, and kind of cut out the elitism. If there's one thing I hate in the video game community, uh, more than trolls and, and all that stuff, and more than fanboys, it's elitism. elitism. And it exists everywhere. And it's always going to exist. But, um, you know, your opinions are just as valid as my opinions. You're just more knowledgeable about the recent ongoings in the games than I am. And you know what? That's okay. I'm okay with that. I hope you're okay with me not being as knowledgeable about the topic, but still wanting to talk about it. Because we are getting a new game on Switch. So if I'm excited for the new game on Switch, shouldn't I be able to talk about what I hope that game is? It's just like when you review a game. Like, like if I end up reviewing Pokemon on Switch, that doesn't mean that I need to have played all the prior Pokemon games. Right? No. I'm reviewing Pokemon on Switch. I'm not reviewing Ultra Sun, Ultra Moon, and all that stuff. Like, I, I'm, I'm looking at that singular game on its own outside of the grander franchise. And some of the things I might praise might be things that are in the prior games. And maybe to you, they're done worse in Pokemon on Switch. But maybe to me, I, I think they're done better. I... We'll cross that bridge when we get there, but I'm going to continue to talk about Pokemon on Switch. It is one of my most anticipated titles that sounds like it's coming this year, especially with recent report that they're localizing the game. So I'm excited for it, and I'm going to continue to talk about it. Uh, what I can promise is if we have a topic on it in the future on the podcast, I'll be sure to include some people that are a little more knowledgeable than me, which isn't that hard. A lot of our audience is more knowledgeable than me. Um, so bring them in and let them kind of take the floor and I can even ask them questions and it might be an interesting conversation to have like, uh, here's a gen one or as people call me compare, you know, to a veteran and having these conversations about Pokemon on switch and, uh, asking questions and getting answers without people being snarky back towards me, I suppose, uh, help me don't insult. It doesn't get you anywhere. All right, moving on. The final comment we're going to talk about this week comes from our sorry extra credits. AAA games shouldn't be more than $60. Lots of love and hate on this one. Uh, but this one, uh, the comment we're going to talk about comes from Gazenja Fox. They say, oh, there's one point that rarely comes up in a discussion on game pricing. The amount of money that goes to publishers from purchases has increased, including in the U.S., even ignoring microtransactions, DLC, and so forth. Most industries, as the costs double at each step of the supply chain for physical goods. I can't speak to gaming. Uh, I think you've mentioned you've worked in a mom and pop store before, so you may have more info on if this applies to games. So if the manufacturer of a product sells it at the distributor for $10, the distributor then sells it to the stores for $20, uh, which then sells it to consumers for $40 to $80. If there's a wholesaler step in between distributor and store, some industries have that added layer, others don't, and some don't have a distributor layer, only having manufacturers of publisher, wholesaler, and store. Uh, digital distribution again, not in the same, uh, not in the games industry, so no actual figures. But you do hear of 80% returns. If these numbers are accurate for gaming, as far as budgets are concerned, that $60 purchase on Steam is worth $48 versus 15 from GameStop. Even if Steam is stingy with its returns, you're still likely looking at $30 versus 15 going to the publisher. The larger a percentage buy from Steam, the Nintendo eShop, etc the more the effective cost of games has increased as far as bottom lines of publishers are concerned. And if it reaches 100%, as many parts of the industry seems to wish it to, the effective price essentially will have risen from 60 to between $120 and $192. Um, so just speaking from personal experience, uh, the margins at retailers for uh, video games is pretty razor thin. It's, it's under 10 bucks. Most games that you get from a AAA studio, a uh, $60 package game, your profit margin is under 10 Sometimes your profit margin is under $5. Uh, this is why Mom and Pop Shots and GameStop and stuff rely so much on used game sales because the profit margins are massive and enough to actually sustain the company. Whereas profit margins on new games, unless everybody's coming to your store to buy every new game that comes out, are too thin for a, a single video game store. Uh, Walmart can have that kind of stuff because they sell a ton of products whether they're thin margins or big margins. Uh, but at just a video game specific store, it's almost impossible to survive on just new game sales. You just don't make enough money to even pay the bills, let alone pay yourself and other employees. Now, that being said, um, video game, as far as I'm aware, I, I obviously worked on the retail end, so I can't tell you much about the insider trends. But for what I have heard from breakdowns from Michael Pactor and other people that have uh, more access to how video games are made, uh, and even there was an episode on extra credits on, on where, the, where your $60 goes to, and, and there's the manufacturing costs and, and the distribution and, and packaging and blah, blah, blah. Um, it sounds like 
that generally over half the cost of a game is profits to the uh, creator of the game, to the publisher. So if a game sells at 60 bucks, something like 30 to $35 of that is quote-unquote profits. Obviously, you don't actually reach profitability until you make over the cost of development back, but per unit sold, $35 gets kicked back. Now, here's the thing. is like This is all made before the game is sold at retail. So like when I buy that $60 game at GameStop, Nintendo's already made the money on that $60 game because it's at GameStop already and, and it was paid for uh, by the sellers. But... Uh, Nintendo obviously wants more and more orders of those games, so if I don't buy that game, well, they've already made the money on that game. If they don't order any more copies of the game, they don't make any more money. So you buying the game actually helps their future profits more than their current profits. That might not be something a lot of consumers are aware of, but yeah, Nintendo basically sells the products in bulk to retailers, and the retailers uh, distribute them, and if they don't order more of it, Nintendo doesn't distribute any more of it, Nintendo doesn't make any money. Nintendo makes money, uh, this is the whole, you know, sold through, which means sold through to consumers, and just shipped. Shipped equals, these are the amount of games that Nintendo's already made money on. So Nintendo cares more about the shipped numbers than the sold through, because the shipped numbers are, you know, that's that's the, you made money on those copies already. So like when you see Amazon or GameStop or something like if they quickly discount a game from sixty dollars to ten dollars, that's because they bought a ton of games from a company and they're not selling, so they're cutting their own losses on it and just trying to get get the inventory out the door for cheap. Uh, and that actually does hurt the people who made the game too, because while they made a higher profit margin on those, they're not going to get any more orders, and it could affect your potential for new games and future orders, etc. You become less trustworthy. Uh, you know, if GameStop expects to sell, say, four million units of Super Mario Odyssey, and they only sell 1.5, that might make them more tepid on the next Zelda game or Mario game that Nintendo tries to bring out. And thus, they might order fewer and fewer copies. And that makes games harder and harder to find. Uh, I think if GameStop would have ordered a lot more copies of Xenoblade Chronicles 2, or Xenoblade Chronicles for Wii when it first came out and they were the only uh, retailer, uh, it would have sold even better. But they didn't order enough copies, and they kept it rare. And GameStop started really abusing the second-hand market for it, selling it for $200 in their own store. Very rare that you see GameStop upcharge a game for more than its base retail price. Uh, but they did that with, <laughs> with Xenoblade, um, and I'm sure they're going to do it in the future because it, when a game's rare, even if it's made rare because of GameStop's own handling of the game, uh, it is what it is. So, yeah, uh, as for digital, obviously digital is, uh, companies love digital because they have found a way to essentially charge us the same money they charge us at retail, but they make way bigger margins. 80% is pretty accurate with the margins there. Uh, the only percent that's taken out is... Uh, Obviously, there's taxes, uh, although those usually show up as extra charges anyways. Uh, so besides taxes, uh, you usually have the platform holder fee, the royalty fee from the platform holder. In Nintendo's case, obviously, they don't pay a royalty fee because it's their system. So Nintendo's own margins on Switch are probably closer to like 95%. Uh, the only 5% I say take out is the cost to, uh, you know, distribute that game to them. You know, basically the bandwidth it takes for the user to download that game might have costed Nintendo anywhere between, you know, 2 to 5 bucks or something like that. But if they bought a $60 game and it cost 2 to 5 bucks to download that game because, say, it's like 30 gigs, well, that's not a big deal because the Nintendo made a $55 profit. Um, kind of insane when you think about it like that. Uh, it's a little different, obviously, for third parties. That's where the 80% comes in because usually there's like a, a 15 to 20, sometimes 30% royalty fee. I think Steam's royalty fee is 30%, and some people scoffed at that when that came out like last year, but that's actually really common. I think Xbox and PlayStation's is also 30%. I think Nintendo's might be 30 as well, but they haven't actually talked about it publicly, um, so maybe it's 20 but either way, uh, it's still a lot higher margin than you get selling a game at retail. Uh, especially because royalty fees also come into play for retail games. Uh, so say Madden comes out and comes to Xbox One or whatever. Uh, not only is that they have the same pricing breakdown as, say, a first-party game, they also additionally have to cut into their profits per game for the royalty fee they have to pay to Microsoft for the right to publish that game on their platform. Uh, that's why platform holders uh, like Sony and Nintendo that make so many exclusive games or fund so many exclusive games 
Uh, they do it because they make huge, huge margins on those games, both at retail and obviously digitally. So, yeah, and the cost of games obviously jumping to $120, $192. With inflation and everything else, and then it, it, it's possible that's where games should cost. But because they are making more money today per unit sold than they were way back when, uh, I think that uh, they're in a good place. Nintendo has consistently shown digital growing for them. Uh, so digital sales are huge. And if, if for anyone who cares about Nintendo's viability, indie games selling really, really well matters for Nintendo too because they get a royalty fee off every sale on the eShop. So say you have uh, Street Fighter 2 sold, you know, a million copies on the eShop. Nintendo will get a cut out of each of those million copies. Uh, the cut could be as much as two or three bucks, million copies. That's two or three million dollars in Nintendo's pocket for just okaying the game just allowing that game to be on their platform. That's the benefit of being a platform holder. Um, Steam does the same stuff. Even though the platform is PC and, and Mac, they own the distribution platform for those games. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the cuts can change. Uh, the Origin might have a lower royalty fee than Steam, as an example. That's just a, com a competitive thing, but it is what it is. Anyways, this was a really long episode of Prime Comments because you guys had a lot to say, and I had a lot to say in response. But I am Nathaniel Ruffle Jans from Nintendo Prime, and if you like this video, you know what to do. Smash that like button, hit the subscribe, hit the bell icon so you're notified of every video and live stream we do. Uh, I really appreciate your guys' support, so much so that you guys can head on over to Patreon dot com slash nintendo prime and support us for as little as one dollar a month uh we are a little bit short of our 300 dollars goal if we hit 300 dollars this month we will be reviewing a brand new game next month and we know there's a couple big games coming out here that you guys might want to see me review if you're interested if you like my reviews i'll also have a link to down in the description if you haven't checked it out i will link to my prior two reviews i've done on this channel for tiny metal for nintendo switch and mario plus rabbit's kingdom battle i will, again will link those to the bottom if you want to see is it worth giving nate money to get a review done if i don't like his style of reviews well go check it out and then you'll know anyways you know what folks i think that's it i mean you could dislike this video if you dislike it too i suppose right all right you know what i'll see you guys next week well i'll see you tomorrow but see you next week on another episode of prime comments catch you in the next one peace prime things happen what is happening i'm i i'm lost in confusion